gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to come together and feast upon your word. I ask that you would filter out all of the foolishness and ignorance, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in Philippians. This will be part 10. And I think I'm going to call this a, a, a continuation or part 2 of our conversation, which was I began talking about in my last video. So we've been going through Philippians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had just begun to look at verse 27, chapter 1 in Philippians verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Uh, there's so much that I want to, st I mentioned in the past, I, I just kind of wanted to sort of linger here for a while. I can't think of a, of a, of a more important t topic to, to, to think about, to meditate on than our conversation in Christ. And I pointed out in my last video, I kind of touched on, on what I believe the, believed was the message that the Holy Spirit was trying to convey here. Uh, I think the Greek brings out more clearly what the Holy Spirit is saying here. What we are looking at here is our manner of living, our manner of walking within the body of Christ. Okay, I, that, that is to say, I do not believe that the 27th verse is primarily individual. The context is the body. Uh, the word for conduct, conduct uh, is where we get our word politic. I mentioned that in my last video. Uh, Politumai, it's to live as a citizen, and we are citizens of heaven. I wish I had kind of brought that out in my last video, but I hope to sort of expound on this. There's two occurrences of this word, uh, the word for conduct. Uh, the only other references in Acts, Acts 23.1, where Paul says, I have lived in all good conscience before God un until this day. And in Hebrews, we read where we've had our conscience is, has been cleansed to serve the living God. Dearly beloved, it, it's, it has been a difficult task for me to try to to present what I see is the truth of these passages in all of these letters that we've gone through. We haven't gone through all of them by any means, but the ones that we have studied through, all of the letters that were written to the churches, the very lifeblood of the church, uh, which I believe is, is basically Romans through Philemon. Um, and please don't write me and say, well, you don't care about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, and, and so on and so forth. As a dispensational uh, believer, uh, dispensational in my theology, and, and this video is not about dispensationalism at all, but it, it clearly is a, a, a point of reference which, in which the, I, I believe the, the diligent student, student of the Word, uh, any, any Bible student, of, a serious Bible student, should take into account uh, the difference between Christ's ministry in the flesh and Paul's ministry of the Spirit in the body context of the church, which is given after the after Calvary. Okay, before before Christ died, before the cross, before he he was crucified, buried, and raised again from the dead. Before there was a gospel, before there was a church. And it's not saying, I'm not saying that suggesting by any means that there's no application 
for the body of Christ, for the truths that we see in John or Acts or Matthew, Mark, or Luke. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is, is that this 27th verse is, is not primarily just individual, okay? The word for conduct is to live as a citizen. Paul says, I've lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. I've lived as a, as a citizen in all good conscience to God unto this day. The word reveals a conduct that rests upon a believer's concern for the body of Christ, not just himself. That's the point I'm trying to make. And I'm persuaded that among many Christians, the primary concern is for ourselves. A concern for others is secondary. And since that is normally the case, our study of the scriptures and our Christian life is directed primarily, at least in our own thinking and in our own minds, at our own situation. You know, and we know, you know, that, that there's that special reserved uh, place in the believer's life, uh, the heart for those who are in going through troubles and difficulties and hardships and circumstances. And, and the, there's that relationship of, of love between the brethren and concern for their brethren. We pray for one another. And I understand all that. But normally, as is the case, and I, I don't think I'm exaggerating one bit, okay, most Christians in the main will read Scripture and they are persuaded that, that, that it's, it's primarily speaking directly to them as opposed to every single other believer in Christ, the body of Christ. This is a body context. So we have to keep that in mind. It's important that we keep in mind that all-important rule of interpretation. And that is that we consider the context. We recognize there's sufferings and hardships in people's lives. And, and many times we simply look at those as the result of sin. We don't recognize that God is working in these individuals as he is in us. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So I wanted to spend some time at least in in before i left the first chapter to try to to kind of focus in on the importance of the body context here and and that and, and how that relates to our conscience before god how our walk uh, to walk worthy before the lord uh, in, in all respects and that being not under law but grace okay grace governs our walk. Now, I am not suggesting either from this text that God is not individually concerned with each of us, but I believe that the text is highlighting the fact that the Holy Spirit's concern is the body of Christ primarily. And we are members of that body. And when one member of the body suffers, we all suffer. And when one member rejoices, we all rejoice. The Holy Spirit is looking here at the body of Christ. Let our manner of life, let our activity in the body of Christ be just that, a recognition that it is his body and that he is the head. Let that manner of activity be counted worthy of Christ's gospel and uh, the Christ. Christ is articulated and it's a genitive. The gospel of, of Christ the good news about Christ, but more particularly the gospel of Christ. Let our manner of life within this body of Christ as a body politic, let our conduct in that body be equal to Christ's good news. Simply put, our conduct within the body should be a, a reflection of our relationship to the body of Christ as a whole, as well as to God himself the truth concerning how we stand before God, who we are in Christ, and what that means as it, as it regards every other member in the body of Christ. 
not just a reflection of our individual relationship to Christ's gospel and more particularly a focus on ourselves and, and things on uh, here below rather than setting our affection on things above where Christ is seated at the right, seated at the right hand of God. Our focus is simply on Christ, not self. I mean, that's the easy way to say it, but but uh, and, and it's amazing how that, you know, you could say make such a simple statement as it's not I but Christ. And yet the Christian will automatically revert back to I every single time. Our growing in grace and knowledge of Christ, our becoming more and more like Christ is really a result of our, if, if you want to call it uh, sanctification or progressive sanctification, our our growth to in maturity, if you want to talk about that subject of growing in maturity, we grow more and more every day into the knowledge of, the sincere and sacred knowledge of who we are in Christ. That's where our focus is. Not, it's not on ourself at all. It's not on ourself at all. And yet that, ten, that tends to be well, the, the focus in the main, and that's, that's, but that's not our focus. Uh, the gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not good news about what you can do, but about who Jesus Christ is, what Jesus Christ has done. Let our manner of life or conduct within the body of Christ be equal to Christ's good news. What is his good news? That he died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again. Okay? We, sh we should not place within the gospel some human definition that detracts from the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It'd be the easiest thing in the world to preach a sermon on, on what your conduct ought to be. I can just go down my list. Okay, don't drink, don't 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 smoke, don't cuss, don't lie, don't steal. I could go on forever. Okay, and if you've been to church one day in your life, dear, dearly beloved, if you have been stepped inside a church building just once in your life, it is more than likely than not that that's what you heard taught. That's what you heard preached. The focus was directed toward self. And it was directed toward sin in the believer's life and how the believer is to, to somehow struggle through that and overcome that by the good graces of God. You know, but it's all it's all it's a legal system that's based on human merit. And that's not what we're looking at in this book at all. Yeah, I mean, with a little effort, I think I could make the text, you know, speak of all the moral aspects of our life within the body of Christ, you know, you know, and what we should do and not do and what I, th I think, you know, that I think the text is saying that how that we can become more acceptable to God and more pleasing to God and, and on and on and on that goes. It, I, I could, I think, if I really try, applied myself, you know, hard enough, I could play devil's advocate and I could just really put you folks under law, okay? That is not the message of the, of the gospel. That is not the message of this book. That is not the purpose of this ministry. Uh, you know, like, as if it refers to a conduct equal to a life consecrated to law keeping as a rule of life. That, that's not what the text is saying. And folks, I am not making light of our responsibility to live responsibly before the Lord while we walk in this body of clay. On the other hand, I do not believe that that is the primary application of this verse. It'd be, it'd be easy to say that to live uh, uh, equal to Christ's good news is to not lie, cheat, steal, etc. You know all you know all that bad stuff, or or any other thing that you want to put in there. I'm convinced that that is not what the text is saying. I think if you were fair with yourselves, you, you would pick those areas in which you're strong, and you areas that you see others are weak in. It, 
if there is not a single false fiber in your being and you would die before you told a lie then of course you would you would you would see you know that garbage in the lives of others and you'd recognize the righteousness in you, and then there you're off, your feet are on the wrong path. For every one of you, there are areas in which you are strong, and there are areas in which you're weak. And we are sorely tempted to look at those areas in which we're strong and see those areas as being uh, lacking. Uh, you know, in the lives of others who don't just just don't happen to be as strong as us in that area. What I'm saying is, is it would be an easy thing to make the opening part of verse 27 works oriented or merit oriented. Whenever I believe without question, the merit that we're looking at here is that of Christ. What does it mean to graciously forgive? How many times should you forgive your brother? 70 times 7. You've got to be kidding. He robbed the bank once. He robbed it twice. That's it. Okay? You know, but 70 times 7. I mean, nobody does that. Right? I mean, we can surely forgive a, a Christian who steals. But if he keeps on stealing, well, I, I don't, you know, I don't know about that. And then go up to 490 times. I mean, wh what about 491? I suppose I'd have to ask, how many times has God forgiven you? How many times has God forgiven you for the same sin? I don't see the verse concentrating on your moral conduct when what it highlights is the majestic person and work of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has not singled out a special select group of believers for, for some unique blessing uh, in which he's given nobody else. Nobody, no, no other Christian in the body is... You know, because they've conducted, you know, they've, they've, their conversation, their conduct, you know, has been uh, of, you know, well, it's more acceptable to others, you know, on a human level. You know, I get messages from people who have watched Blessed Hope Forever saying, you just can't find a church like this where I live. And that may be true. I'm not certain that's true. I, I am perfectly willing to agree. There may be those who haven't found the body of Christ with whom they want a fellowship at the moment, but I do not believe that God has marked off the area where you live as a dead zone, kind of like, you know, the cellular reception, kind of like, you know, that's a dead zone where you can't get any, any spiritual reception. I, I don't believe that at all. It has amazed me over the years how that no matter where I have been, where I go, I've, I'll, I'll, I've run into somebody who knows and loves the Lord. I see them as a member of the body of Christ. I am not willing to say that we here at Blessed Hope Forever are more mature than any other fellowship of believers on the internet or, or the world, in the world. I, I believe the verse is clearly saying that God is interested in the body. And that includes more than blessed hope forever so that our manner of conduct within the body of christ so that it becomes equal to to christ's good news that means that i must as i've tried to suggest again and again i must focus my attention on things above not on things below i do not believe the opening portion of verse 27 is directing my attention on how we become better Christians, but on how we live in respect to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Conduct equal to the good news of Jesus Christ. And I know that that is not true in the case of many groups who fellowship together over what they believe to be the truth of God's word. They have taken the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they've turned it around so that it applies to, to humanistic philosophy and to a merit-oriented system using the right cliches and, and the right programs and, and you know, even, uh, you know, true sayings, which sometimes can be more harmful to the hearers and, than, than you think. Depends on the timing. I've always found it difficult to walk up to somebody who's just lost a loved one and just and just say, hey, well, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly. 
I think you know, I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I've got grand news for you. Christ's good news. Is, and that is he died for your sin. He was buried. He rose again. And that means that his death for your sin is effective. You're declared righteous because you've been made righteous in Christ. And, and that as Paul is saying that whether I come and see you or else be absent, either way, I may hear of your affairs. That you're standing fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Okay? What is wrong with basking in the glory and the majesty of the person of Jesus Christ? What's wrong with that? Nothing. And what's what tends to get in the way of that? Stop and think. It's yourself. Your, your situation, your circumstances, your condition, your mood, whatever, your mood swings, you know, you wake up one day, you know, how are, how am I feeling today? I'm not feeling very good at all. And then you go down your list is of explanations as to why. It's it really is funny. I you know, and, you know, I, and, and folks, I'm not being critical. I see in my own life, I see that very thing. You know, I'm, I'm filling up one day. Some something brings me down. It's it's, and I understand it's hard to keep our focus constantly on things above, not on things below. I understand that, but that's what we're told to do. It's just, it's not the desire of most Christians. It's not our natural inclination to do that, okay? Something, some tragedy falls upon us and we immediately just look away to Christ and say, well, it's okay. It's that's not usually our initial reaction. But it is the, the reaction of maturity, I believe. It's, that is our conversation. Our focus is on Christ. It has always been on Christ. It should always be on Christ. It always will be on Christ. It'll never be on ourselves. We need to stop that now. Christian, Christian dumb. Okay, and I'm, I'm using that, that phrase and, you know, as a, sort of as a whole, okay, Christendom as, as a whole has basically abandoned the roots, the very roots of its faith, which is in Christ, because the whole the whole program is is. Is customized to, to designed to look the other way. To ourselves, not to Christ. And it's just, a, it's an odd thing to do, you know, it's to spend the majority of our time focused on, on Him rather than our, our, ourselves. That it just it seems so contrary to human nature. Well, guess what? It is. That's, if you can begin to understand that, you can begin to understand the heart of the Holy Spirit through Paul. We have not been individually graced, gifted, or blessed above and beyond any other member of the body of Christ. You will, folks, you will not find that written anywhere in any context of the New Testament believer under grace. Okay? But that is without question the most popular thought. Okay? In, in living under law... To, 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 to get us under into God's good graces is just backwards, okay? Living under law is not going to get you in, into God's good graces. Why is that? Well, because you've already received grace upon grace. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That, that it is such a beautiful statement. Now, I want you to notice that in order that, you, we've got a hint of clause here. It's a that. Let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. 
one unmovable. Notice it's unmovable here. Okay, that's the standing fast. Okay, one unmovable spirit, mind, and faith as it pertains to the gospel's faithfulness. Don't ignore the genitive, okay? The faithfulness of the gospel. And we're not just seeing the concern of Paul. That's where God's concern is as well. And well, you know, we got great concerns. You know, will social media, uh, uh, you know, lock us all up in, in jail? You know, or will will Social Security run out before we reach the age of 60, whatever it is now? Will inflation continue so that, you know, it won't be long before we pay a $100,000 for an old pickup? You know, uh, will the U.S. go to war with Russia or China? Transforming Earth into a, some a thermonuclear wasteland? Look, folks, we don't have to look very far for a concern. I'm sure... I'm, I am glad that I know a God who's stronger than a nuclear bomb. But, but that concern aside, if I don't toss context aside, what I see here is a divine concern, okay? That our conduct within the body be equal to the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, not whether we're going to blow ourselves up or whether God will approve my performance or, or somehow find me acceptable. Our concerns are about the things usually, normally, in most cases, you must agree with me, they're about things below. That's where our primary concerns tend to be. Why is it so hard for me to believe you? You know, Sue says I'm half nuts sometimes. Some of the things I do, I don't have any problem believing her. Why can't I believe God? Why can't I trust God the same way? Why can't I set my affection on things above? Why does it matter? What does it even matter? I mean, to live as Christ, to die as gain, remember? Okay, so why does it matter? My concern is, how have you lived in the body of Christ concerning the good news of Christ that I may hear of your affairs? Okay? Paul's going to hear, or he may hear. The word means uh, things that surround you or, or are, are through you. You could translate it either way. On all sides. Every base is covered. It could be translated either way. That you all, and that's plural, all, plural, okay? As a body, stand firm, okay? It'd be easy to, 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 it's easy to just look and see, is it singular or plural? It's plural, all right? Speaking to the body of Christ, which includes you, okay? But you can't say it's singular, it's plural. That you all, as a body, Stand firm. That I may hear of your affairs. The word mind there is soul. The soul of every member in the body. The English word would be psychic. It's, it's suke is the Greek word. But you know, but that psychic gives you the wrong idea. I'm, I'm going to translate it soul. This is the aspect of your, our, our makeup, which makes us conscious of the activity that goes on around us. The activity that I believe directs us to that manner of conduct within the body of Christ, the way that we live in the body of Christ, striving together in that area, in the body of Christ together, okay? And my English translation says, for the faith of the gospel. That's the, so you can translate that, the gospel's faithfulness, and it is. God is faithful. in our activity in the body of Christ, centered in Christ's good news and in the faithfulness of the good news. And you, and you say, well, I don't understand that. 
Uh, I don't understand that. Or maybe you don't say that, but the problem I see among many Christians is that we have been so conditioned to look at the Big Ten, you know, or or the Little 20 or whatever. Can't, can't paint your toenails or who knows what. We find it very difficult to center our affection on things above, to settle our attention in the person, in the work of Jesus Christ. This ministry, Blessed Hope Forever, if it stands for anything, It's in getting you to realize that we settle our affection in on things above and in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. How does God handle sin? Well, sin, sin questions settled forever in Christ. Why hasn't it been in your life? Could it be because you haven't believed the gospel? Our life in Christ is not about settling some debt in relation to sin. Okay? But in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, for the majesty of Christ, we're not living in a merit-based, legal-oriented system. We are not living in a law-oriented system. We are living under grace. And I see that word grace, and I hear that word grace all the time, and the, the very sacred substance of grace, I hear it thrown around so loosely, so casually today. Folks, I don't know if I'm making the point, but I see people concentrating on a lot of garbage instead of on the grace of God. And it breaks my heart to see Christians doing this. I'm not, talk, we're not, I'm not talking about people who are outside the body of Christ. I'm talking about His people, God's people. And God has always, just read the book, He's always been concerned about His people. He's always made a provision for His people. He's always been there for His people. He's never leaving them nor forsaken them. You, you wouldn't know that if you talk to your average Christian on the street today who thinks that, that God's going to leave him at the drop of a hat if he does something wrong or that he believes that God has already done that because of something that he did. And it breaks my heart because it doesn't have to be that way. Folks, how should I look at you when you sin? Gosh, I don't know. Maybe, you know, how does think of maybe maybe think about how God looks at me when I sin? But I don't see I don't see that happening. That is not the unmovable spirit, mind, and faith that I see in the text. It's certainly not what I'd want. It's certainly not what I would strive for, labor heavily toward. Everything that, that I tried to do in my own strength, everything that I tried to accomplish through my own will and my own strength, were that... And, and the only reason for that is because my focus was in the wrong place. My focus was on me. Okay, I'm, We're not walking through this world, folks, in Christ, every moment of every day, looking at a mirror, looking at us, looking at our own reflection. Okay, We're looking at Christ in the Word. When we look at Him, God in His great love and mercy and grace for us will allow us to see Christ in ourselves and others will see Christ in ourselves. Dearly beloved, God here in this passage is revealing His heart 
It's not just Paul's, listen to me, please. It's not just Paul's concern for the Philippians that we're seeing here. God is revealing his heart. He's opening his own heart. Our Father, the Holy Spirit, our Lord Jesus Christ, is, is, they are opening their own heart to you to reveal to you that when Christ comes to receive us unto himself, this is what he wants to see. And not only that, meantime, while we wait for the return of the Lord, that's the interest of God. That's the concern of God, and so it ought to be ours. Philippians is a marvelous little letter in that it deals with the conduct within the body of Christ. In, in, back in Ephesians, when we went through the book of Ephesians, you know, we saw we were taken out of Adam and we were placed into the body of Christ, you know, fashioned into one who, who is meat for Christ, is, is what we have to look forward to. We came from Christ. We're fashioned for Christ. We have the grand revelation of the body of Christ in Ephesians and Philippians. Well, you even see it in Galatians. In Colossians, we have the doctrine of the body of Christ. Folks, these are letters to the churches. Okay? God, it amazes me how Christians can be so divided today. When, when God loves us all the same, we belong to Him. We haven't received one thing from God that another believer for whom Christ died has not received. Now in the next study, we'll, we'll look at our not being intimidated by those who oppose the gospel uh, and and not look at it as some strange thing that's happening to us. You know, especially when some of those could be our, our own brothers and sisters in Christ, not just Satan's children. Just want to take a moment to just thank you all sincerely from the bottom of my heart for your continued interest in these studies in Philippians. Uh, I want to thank you for all of your kind comments, your messages, your, your words of encouragement that you send me which really mean a lot. I want to thank you for help, helping support this ministry. Until next time, rest in Him, and thanks for watching.